All right, we've already seen the H5 Phoenix board, the Atari ST remake board working, running demos. Now, in today's video, I'm gonna spend some time showing why this is so awesome. Let's get to it. All right, so there's a lot of things that make this special. Obviously, it's a replica board, but what is so amazingly special about this is that we have these expansion buses so we can easily add in various different expansions. We also have the blitter socket right here ready to go. I have my blitter chip right here ready to go in. I also have this as one of the first expanders I want to put in place, and this is a TOS ROM decoder. This allows for TOS 2.06 and 1.04 to be run on the computer. 1.04 already can run on the computer, but this, this allows for the 2.06 to be decoded by the, by the CPU and actually run properly. All right, so this is number two. Number three, we have a terrible Fire 536. You know I love these boards. I've got it in a few of my computers, both Amigas and Ataris. There's an ST version of it. I'd love to have one of those. I don't have one at the moment, but this guy, we want to test it out in here. There's There's been issues with stability of this board running in my Mega ST with TOS 2.06. It runs perfectly beautifully with Emu TOS, but I'd like to see if I can't get this guy running in TOS 1.06 because the board is, the, the Phoenix board is cleaner from a signal perspective, less likely to cause issues. Then lastly, this, is your standard candy bar, well, I mean, not so standard candy bar, CPU. And the most important part is the very last three digits on this guy, P16. This is a 16 megahertz chip, and with the right settings on the TOS decoder board and this chip, we can run a 16 megahertz CPU, 68,000 CPU on this computer. All right, let's get to it. Okay, we will start by looking at this side of the board. And what you might notice, this is new, cartridge slot, super awesome. Was able to salvage one off of my donor board. It took a little while to get it off, but it looks like it's in place. Actually, it is in place and I've tested it out, but I'll, I'll show it working. In addition, let's do the next step here. We've got the blitter chip here. We got the, hopefully you can see on the top right here, there's a little dot marking pin one. On the board here, that there's a dot facing this direction, marking pin one. We can obviously look also at where the different shaped corners are. So we put that in, move these two jumpers to the disconnected position. And then we're gonna boot this up. We'll get those, get this, test out the blitter. We'll test one thing at a time. That's usually the best way to approach it. Okay. All right. So next parts, we're going to just get this power supply hooked up here. Plug it in. Actually, we'll plug it in just a second. We've got the monitor port plugged in. Well, the monitor plugged in. We'll connect the GoTech. Right now, it's set up for SysInfo. So it'll boot right into SysInfo. Just make sure that we're good. Yeah, we're good there. We do need a keyboard plugged in. Get this guy properly connected over here. Get that monitor flipped on. PSU plugged in. Oops. Can I get you? There you go. Locked in. There we are. Perfect. And power it on. Zoom out just a smidge. Perfect, we're at the desktop in medium resolution. Take a look at sysinfo. There we 
we go. Blitter available and on. The blitter is detected at least. So the next step is, well, one other step. What I want to do now, we'll power this guy off. And then we're going to take out and test the cartridge slot. So what I'm going to do here is we're going to find a simple, we'll take my Raspberry Pi 520 ST to prop up this end. Just have it rest on there. Yes, it's not perfect. There could be some board flex, but it's not going to be tremendous. All right. We've got a diagnostic cartridge plugged in and power back on. There we go. Let's do a couple of quick tests. Let's test timing first off. All right, perfect. Let's test a short blit test. Pass. All right. Long blit test. All right. Blitter passed. That is that tests out a couple things, right? We tested both the blitter and the cartridge slot. Great. Awesome. That's done. Now we're going to try the toss decoder. Okay. Let's just unplug the PSU. With the toss decoder here, this simply plugs in to one of these sockets here. And we'll need to connect the CE signal. The CE signal comes from this guy right here. And so what this does is this removes or changes decoding the toss from the, from the glue, the glue chip to this board here. All right, perfect. So we're just going to connect to these little guys underneath here. We'll start with this. Plug this in. And swap that out. Connect that line in here. Plug this back in. And then what we're going to do is I'm going to change this jumper to open. And by changing the jumper to open, it selects the different part of the TOS ROM, selecting the TOS 1.06. So let's flip the switch, power on. And then we're going to boot into sysinfo again. Obviously, that Atari symbol is a, a, a signal that TOS 2.06 is detected and starting to boot. And then we'll just go up here, boot up sysinfo. Blitter is available and off. I could probably turn it back on but we are showing TOS 2.06. Perfect. It's doing what we're expecting it to do. Control Q. My guess is I have to, there we go. Now it's on, now the blitter is on. It should probably show it is on now. Yep, available and on. Perfect. All right, this is working really well. I've tested out a few of these things already, but everything seems to be going perfectly fine. Now that's a good sign that uh, now that I've said that, that there might be issues, but we'll see. All right, the next thing I wanna do, and this is gonna be the more interesting part. We're going to now disconnect the power disconnect the PSU and I'm going to remove the CPU that's in there, the PLCC CPU. Brr, come on. Man. There we go. Perfect. Pull them off. 
use a lovely little PLCC chip extractor. And we'll leave the blitter installed. That might cause an issue, it might not, we'll see. We will see. All right, so this board, the notch is there, notch is there. Let's move you out of the way. You're all lined up. And in place. Okay, plug you back in. Just double check a few things. Yeah, it looks like everything's working or plugged in properly. We'll boot up to sysinfo again. This time with a terrible fire, 68030 at 50 megahertz. I like the little clicky sound. We have the cache on. So at the moment, the blitter is available and off, running 2.06. The frequency, I know that's wrong. It's running at 50, 50 megahertz, but we have the 68 or 30 running on here. All right, so the next step, what, what I want to try out next is actually running with the hard drive attached. So that's going to be where I've had issues in the past is that we're using the external hard drive under TOS 2.06. So, we power off, power everything off, and connect up the Ultra Satan, one of my favorite devices in the world. One thing I don't have is I don't have any fast RAM um, software loaded into my auto directory on this uh, hard drive image, so we won't have any of the it won't accelerate nearly as quickly because it won't be able to run anything in fast RAM, at least for the moment. If it so works. <laughs> Sorry, I was so interested in looking at the board. Forgot to move the camera over here. All right. So, did it, are we powered on? We are powered on. The Ultra Satan doesn't look like it was detected properly. Interesting. No, it's not detecting the devices there. Let's see what we can do here. What I'm gonna do now is I'm going to disable the blitter. Let's remove the blitter. Because really there's no need for a blitter if I have a TF-536 in here, 60 out of 30. swap those headers over here again. There we go. Back on. Just making sure we're plugged in properly. All right, we are good to go.
Come on, detect. Hmm. That's unfortunate. Let me see what we can do here. <laughs> this wasn't plugged in. It was popped out. No wonder it wasn't detecting it. <laughs> oh, dear. You got to love it when you make stupid mistakes. Yeah, the SD card wasn't plugged in properly, so let's try again. Okay. Come on, come on. Yes. We are booted in. Okay, cache is off. I've read that having the cache on can cause issues. And 2.06. Let's take a look at Gembench. We all always love Gembench. Okay, so we're measuring against, let's just load up a, a 10, standard 1040ST. Oh, that's weird. All right, we'll just run against a 1040 STE. We'll test it out real quick. Okay, as you can see here, this performs really not as good as an STE for a number of reasons. The blitter chip's not in there. Um, primarily that, all right? but the energy division is substantially higher. The other part I need to make certainly take a look at, all right, is what you can see here. We're running from ST RAM. It didn't detect the fast RAM either. So what that means is there's, there's a bunch of other ancillary programs I need to boot up in the auto folder in order to properly get the most out of the Terrible Fire 536. That's, we're not going to do that in the rest of this video today because that can be a, probably a video all on its own at some point in the future, setting up a Terrible Fire 536 and really probably not tremendously useful to very many people in the community. I would recommend that if you wanted a, a, this type of accelerator board, you go for an ST536 instead. It is much less beta. This is very much a beta, um, not supported by Exos at all. The ST536 is and is in much better compatibility state than this. This is very much kind of a uh, proof of concept kind of a situation here. All right, so what we're gonna do next, we're gonna need to power off everything. I'm going to remove the Terrible Fire 536, put the blitter back in, and then actually I'll need to solder a jumper point on the decoder as well as grab a 16 or 32 megahertz, I don't remember if it's 16 or 32 megahertz signal to drive the 16 megahertz for the acceleration for this CPU. All right, let me get everything all ready to go and we can not, you'll not have to worry about looking, looking for me, watching, <laughs> you want to worry about watching me looking for a bunch of stuff, okay? We're first going to reinstall the blitter go right here and then we'll disconnect these two jumpers and then we will remove carefully the terrible fire 536 my little spudger all right here we go key is off The next part is I'm going to remove this guy, the toss decoder, 
and accelerator for a couple of reasons. I want to connect this guy to get the signal. This is the 16 meg, it's a 16 megahertz signal that I need to pull off of the shifter chip. Okay. And, oh dear, you gotta love it when you just make sure it didn't do any damage. Of course, no damage done. But if you take a look here, there we go. We need to connect to shifter pin 39 for the 16 megahertz signal, as you can see with that. So we'll connect this guy up to this. Whether I, you know, eventually I may end up creating a solder point for this to connect to, but right now we'll just, we'll just use this little grabby guy. And hook this guy back up here. This is the CE signal. And I'm going to move this to up here. Oh, I have a pin that's bent, of course. I thought I checked it for damage when I dropped it. Where are my, here we go. Straighten out that pin. Any others? Nope, we're all good. And we plug him in here and pin 39. So this is one, this is a 40 pin. Pin 39 is right here. On the shifter chip. Okay. And the last thing to do is to plug in the 16 megahertz CPU. I'm just going to check the uh, the pins on the bottom. we go. Sorry if you saw my back of my head a lot. I think we're good to go though. We have this grabby guy there in place. We have this guy set up here. And we are set for TOS 2.06. Blitter is on. Oh, of course, you're probably thinking, you said you had, there was something about soldering. Yes, I forgot to solder some jumper pads. And that is gonna have to happen now. Spudger go. There you are. We're going to have to pop you off again. There we go. Okay. Now I'm going to come from a different angle so that I hope I don't block off anything here. Oh, there's my solder. Actually, I don't have to solder anything. I have to desolder something. That's even easier. It's this little blub right here. Get off that excess solder. I think we got it. Just do a quick continuity check. Make sure there's no connection there between those two points. Before I go sticking that CPU back on. 
Yep, we're good. All right, CPU goes back on now. We are in place. Hard drive back on. And we are good to go. Screen on, power on. That's promising. All right, let's first do a sysinfo. Oh, I didn't like that. Interesting. Let's just uh, restart. Repower back on. So that sysinfo program didn't like it. Let's see about the hard drive. I'm going to do a quick gem bench. Okay. Blitter enabled, blitter enabled. We're running it. Uh, let's do a full all test, see if it makes it through. And it bombs out. Interesting. Let's see. Yep, totally. Something's going on here. It was obviously working faster. Let me try something else again. All right, so what I did, I actually swapped out the CPU. I picked up two of these P16 CPUs, just in case. So let's take a look. That makes a difference here. Now that's not positive. All right, let's see what we got going on. Okay. So my guess is that could be some of the pins are not getting the best contact with the turn holes versus the flat pins. That could be part of it. I don't know. Because all I did is I pulled out the CPU and put it back in. Yeah. Okay, something's going on. We're uh, not stable at all. That's not happy. All right. Let's see if I can do a little more research here. Okay. So I think I found the issue. And the issue resided in, probably, in the fact that it is the round, turnaround pins versus the flat pin CPU. What I did in order to correct that was simply stretch the legs out a little bit so that they're sprung inside the socket so they're making better contact that, that, that's what i've done here i actually got out of the mouse to make things easier we're going to do a gem bench and test out now let's see what we can get going here let's do a test let's do all tests 
Okay, we made it through stably. Things didn't crash. I think everything's working properly now. As you can see here, this is getting quite a bit of uplift actually from the, the CPU running at 16 megahertz versus eight megahertz in benchmarking software. <laughs> That's great, it's wonderful, but let's take a look at what it might look like. Let's see if we can't find uh, Frontier Bench. Frontier Bench is in here, yeah, Front Bench. See how this guy looks. There are some issues with the graphics output here. So I'm, yeah, we crashed. Mm. And I'm gonna, well, I'm, I'm still haven't gotten a good solution yet. All right, it's a few days later. I had a little think. I reached out a little bit on the Exos forum, just a tiny little bit. Uh, about the issue I was having with the video stability. And you know what I thought? I started thinking, you know, I have a whole ton of shifter chips. Well, not a ton. I have an extra three or four, right, of, of shifter chips that I had available. And so why not just pop in a different shifter chip? <laughs> and with the acceleration working, it's, uh, it's flawless now. It's been running rock solid with Frontier Bench. I don't know, past 20, 20 minutes or so. I wanted to see if I got those graphical glitches and that bombing out. I'm not sure exactly what's wrong with that shifter chip because it works flawlessly at eight megahertz. I, I haven't seen any issues with it. But, well, with the CPU running at eight, eight megahertz, with the CPU running at 16 megahertz, it starts having some, the glitchiness, right? And so that appears to be the cause of what we're seeing. Now, regarding what does this booster do for you? It, it makes the desktop environment run snippier, snappier. It's nice, it's it's cool that way. From a gaming perspective, you know, some of the games that you would think that run the fastest or be, benefit the most from this, uh, not too much. So Frontier Bench, which if you see this, if you can see the number on the screen, it's running at around 840-ish frames, it, running at stock eight megahertz with NTSC, not with PAL. PAL has, a, has additional frames and actually runs longer effectively. Um, but with NTSC, it typically runs in the 770 frames range. So there's a little bit of an uplift. I would say it's probably not something you would notice. All right. Um, but still, it's neat. It's cool. It's something else done to this guy. And uh, yeah, I, I'm going to keep it in there as it is for the time being. I might shift over the TF536 at some point in the future. I know it works per flawlessly in here. I'm also looking at an ST536, see if I can't either find someone who might be willing to build one for me, or I might try building one again. I tried building a TF536 oh, about three years ago. I failed miserably, miserably, three, four years, whatever it was, a while back, right? And I kind of have stayed off of that. Now, I've learned a lot more about SMB soldering, so who knows, maybe I'll try it again in the future. All right, enough of me yammering on. This is where it's at today, this H5 board. At some point, I'll probably, I might try to stick it in a case, but um, for the now, it's doing everything I want it to do. It's awesome. Now, there could be some other things, again, in the future. There's a uh, MIDI, uh, MIDI output sound output that I could probably pop in here as well to get MIDI direct sound output. That would be super cool. Not today, not for the ne next near term for serial future. I think we're in a good place now. All right, thank you so much for watching. And uh, you know, if you want one of these, if you wanna try your hand in an H5 Phoenix board, please, please, please reach out on, on Exos's forum. Say that you want them. Say that, uh, let them know, let him know that you would like to build one of these. Because if there's demand, I'm sure he'd be more than willing to make more of these or get more of these made. These are fantastic. They're a cool platform to do all sorts of tinkering. If you want to tinker with an Atari ST without having to worry about desoldering your CPU, potentially damaging your old board, this is a great route to tinker and get basically a real true Atari ST experience on a brand new board. 
All right. Again, like I said, thanks for watching. Have a fantastic day. Talk to you later. Bye.